Before we proceed to the today's first plenary, there are a couple of housekeeping announcements. People who haven't got their travel reimbursement yet, please visit the travel reimbursement desk at tea or lunch break. People who haven't, uh, like whatever, registered for workshops, please go for the respective workshops and give us a feedback online. Mm. Yesterday afternoon, I walked into the main auditorium and saw Leon Pin talking about conservation drones and its application in the field of conservation. The images and videos of orangutans and a tropical forest of Southeast Asia taken by these unarmed cameras were mind blowing. And the work he's doing as a part of the conservation drone, a non-profit organization of who he is also a founding director, is just fascinating. And it gives me a great pleasure to introduce today's plenary speaker, Dr. Leon Pinku. His research focuses on addressing emerging environmental and socioeconomic cha challenges facing tropical developing nations, including threats of intensifying land use conflicts to natural ecosystems and wildlife. His research, especially on the biodiversity extinctions and spread of oil palm plantations in Southeast Asia, is highly cited. Lian Pin is from Singapore. He has finished his bachelor's and master's degree from the University of Singapore in 2003 where he got an opportunity to work with Dr. Sundi, followed by his doctoral research is from Princeton University. He then moved to Zurich for his postdoctoral training at the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology. After that, he was appointed as a Swiss National Science Foundation Assistant Professor in 2011. And currently, he is Associate Professor and Chair of Applied Ecology and Conservation Unit at the University of Adelaide, Australia. He's recently awarded an Australian Research Council Future Fellowship. Leon Pin is also a research regional technical advisor for Conservation International, a TED speaker, and Indo-Pacific Indo Australia Asia editor for biological conservation. Today, he's going to talk, about, talk to us of much needed topic of balancing priori priorities of conservation and consumption. I would like to invite Dr. Leon Pinko to the podium. Um, very good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks, <coughs> sorry, thanks very much for the kind introduction. Um, before I begin, I'd also like to thank um, Ravi, especially, and his team of um, organizers for inviting me to this uh, conference. Uh, it's a great honor and pleasure to be here. Uh, I would also like to thank you, the audience, for showing up today. I understand it's the last day of the conference, and uh, we tend to get very tired, um, especially at this early uh, in the morning. Um, yesterday, we had a very successful workshop on conservation drones. Um, so I'd like to thank the participants, all 26 of them, for being such uh, wonderful students. If any of you are interested in conservation drones and didn't get the opportunity to, to, come, up, uh, to come for the workshop yesterday, uh, please come and uh, speak to me or email me or visit our website, uh, conservationdrones.org, uh, for more information. Now, Today, I'll be talking about something slightly uh, different. I'll be giving uh, a broad overview, a thematic overview of some of the research questions that I've been uh, grappling with over the last few years. Um, like most of my talks, um, this will not be a technical one. So um, please feel free to relax, sit back, and uh, try to stay at least half awake. So, how many of you know which city this is? That's, that's right. So, this is Singapore. Um, it's a very recent uh, image of the Singapore skyline. Um, I left Singapore about 10 years ago for my studies in the U.S. and have been living abroad uh, ever, ever since. Um, so, this is actually quite an unfamiliar uh, sight of Singapore to me. This is how the skyline uh, looked like in 2004 when I left. So even within just a span of 10 years, Singapore has transformed quite uh, dramatically. Now I'm, I'm a third generation Singaporean, so I often wondered what my great grandparents um, uh, might have seen when they first arrived in Singapore as early immigrants from, from southern China. So this is an image of early Singapore. This is probably in the late 1800s or early 1900s. 
it's an image taken roughly at the same uh, area where the two previous uh, photographs were taken. Uh, this is near the mouth of the Singapore River. So even at that time, Singapore was already undergoing tremendous uh, change, especially in the interior of the island where you know, large tracts of forests were being cut down to make way for um, all kinds of uh, cash crops and plantations. So at that time, we had betel nut plantations, um, coconut plantations, pepper plantations, um, tapioca, and rubber estates were quite common. Rubber was a major uh, industry then. And partly because of this rapid conversion of forests to other uh, land uses, plantations and cash crops, many of our native wildlife species were driven out of their natural habitats. Uh, some were hunted and killed by the local settlers and immigrants. We used to have uh, large reptiles, uh, charismatic mammals, and even tigers. Within, but within a matter of a few decades, all these were wiped out. Um, in fact, between 1819, when, when the British arrived, and the late 1900s, Singapore lost about 95% of its primary forests. And with that, we lost up to about 80% of um, the species diversity of some of our taxonomic groups, especially the mammals, um, the fish, the arthropods, and the plants. So why am I telling you about Singapore? No, after all, it's just a tiny speck of an island on our planet. It's, it's actually about the same size as Bangalore. It's only about 700 square kilometers. But I, th I think Singapore is a story that deserves telling because um, there might be lessons to be learned from what happened in Singapore. And I think what happened in Singapore was ultimately driven by a rapidly increasing pressure on a set of finite resources by a very rapidly growing uh, population. And as we know very well, global human population is also or has been rapidly expanding for a while. The latest uh, study by the uh, United Nations and the University of Washington concluded that there is an 80% chance that we uh, would be expecting more than 12 billion people by the year 2100. So we are now up to about 7.1 billion, um, well on the way to that, um, to that number. Now these additional people will require more food. There will be more mouths to feed. But not only will they require more food, they will also require or demand for better quality food. Foods that are higher in fats and protein contents, uh, which would require more land and more water to produce. But food is not the only issue we face because we also need to produce more energy, especially renewable forms of energy to drive and to power our societies. Now, if biofuels or the conventional biofuels were to become the dominant source of renewable energy in the future, then even more land would have to be turned over to agriculture. And that would almost certainly intensify land use conflicts. Now at the same time, we need to protect what remains of our forests and, and natural habitats and biodiversity, especially those in the tropics where they are most threatened. But that is not all, because while we are producing more food, more energy, protecting our forests and wildlife, we also need to think of ways to reduce our carbon emissions, reduce our greenhouse gas emissions, including emissions from land use change and forestry. And of course, at the end of the day, we need to be able to sustain economic growth and development, um, not only in the richer uh, developed countries, but in many other societies, big and small, across the world. Now, each one of these priorities is an enormous task on its own, but our challenge is in fact even more daunting because oftentimes these global level priorities are in conflict with one another at local and regional scales. 
Now, for example, our need to produce biofuels can compete with our need to produce more food. And our need to produce more food often conflicts with our need to protect biodiversity. And our need to protect forests and species uh, can come into conflict with our need for ever more uh, development. So decision makers in many countries, especially in developing countries, are faced with having to balance um, human and economic development on the one hand and environmental protection on the other. So as you can imagine, uh, this is not an easy task. So I often ask myself, what can we as environmental and social scientists do to help? Uh, personally, um, in my research, I try to clarify the issue and better define the problem um, through um, acquir acquiring more data and more data analysis. Let me give you some examples. And let us come back to Southeast Asia for a minute. So Southeast Asia still contains about 15% or roughly 200 million hectares of tropical forests uh, in the world. About 44% of these forests are found on the islands of Indonesia. That's about 100 million hectares. Now, unfortunately, as we know very well, Indonesia uh, has one of the highest deforestation rates in the world. Every year, about 800,000 hectares of forests are lost. That's about uh, two football or soccer fields uh, sized uh, forests that are lost every minute. Now, most of these forests are uh, lost from the lowlands. So Indonesia is losing a lot of lowland primary forests and wetland primary forests. Indonesia also contains one of the highest concentrations of rare and endemic species. Now many of these species are not found anywhere else in the world. Um, and because of the rapid land use change that is happening in Indonesia, hundreds of uh, its wildlife species are listed, are red listed by the IUCN. So what's driving deforestation in Indonesia? Well, there are the usual suspects. There is oil palm, logging, uh, fiber plantations, and mining. So we are quite um, confident that these are the four main industries that are uh, exploiting the forests. But what we are not so sure about is uh, the extent, the relative extent to which uh, these four industries are causing deforestation. In other words, we don't know how much blame we can apportion to uh, each industry. And that became um, uh, an important question in my research group. And recently, one of my postdocs, uh, Sinan Abud, decided to, uh, to tackle this uh, question. So Sinan collected some information, some spatial information on land use land cover across Indonesia for the year uh, 2000 and 2010. He also collected some information on the uh, concession boundaries of each of these uh, industries, uh, oil palm, pulp and paper, mining and logging. And with those two key pieces of information, he performed um, a quite a straightforward change detection analysis just to see how much forest was uh, lost in each of these uh, industries or within the concession boundaries of each of these industries. And this is what he found. So between 2000 and 2010, uh, five, uh, roughly about 5.6 million hectares of forests were lost uh, within the concessions of these four uh, main industries. Most of the forests were lost from the lowlands and specifically from the lowland forests within logging concessions. Um, although pulp and paper and oil palm plantations were also uh, experiencing uh, very uh, massive amounts of uh, deforestation. For the peat swan forests, it was a slightly different story. Uh, in that forest, it was pulp and paper and oil palm that were uh, driving uh, deforestation. So why, why is this important? Um, why are we presenting this information? Well, I think it's important to publish these numbers so that we force the um, Indonesian decision makers 
and the industry players to face up to the issue. And by presenting these numbers, we also allow the Indonesian uh, public, the society uh, in general, to decide for themselves if there is a problem here and if there is a problem, what should be done uh, to address this problem. So let me come back to, uh, or rather let me focus on the oil palm issue for a minute um, because this is something that's close to my heart. I've been working on the oil palm issue in, uh, in Southeast Asia for the last 10 years. And this, in fact, is a picture that I took during my PhD uh, research in Sabah, East Sabah. And it's literally a sea of palm trees uh, all the way to the horizon and, and beyond. Now, in that part of Borneo, it's fairly common to see um, what they call oil palm complexes that are tens of thousands of hectares uh, large and they are comprised of largely just oil palm plantations. So oil palm, as we know, is one of the most rapidly expanding equatorial crops in the world. Today it's cultivated mainly in Malaysia, Indonesia, but also in coastal West Africa, Central and South America. Uh, the total extent of oil palm cultivation accounts for almost one-tenth of permanent crop lands worldwide. This graph shows us how rapidly oil palm production has increased over the last 50 years. The blue and red bars indicate uh, Malaysia and Indonesia's palm oil production. Um, currently, they are the world's two largest uh, oil palm producers, uh, by far the two largest pr producers. Together, they account, account for almost 90% of global production. This is um, a similar graph uh, showing the, uh, the extent, the area that is harvested for oil, for oil palm uh, in these two countries. Now, since the two early 2000s, Indonesia overtook Malaysia to become the world's largest uh, oil palm producer. Um, but that is not the end of the story because uh, Indonesia recently announced its plans to double oil palm production. So it already is the world's largest producer and it's going to double production. So this is um, causing a lot of concern among conservationists for obvious reasons. Um, so we are very uh, worried about what would happen to the, uh, the forests and, and wildlife. So why, why is there such a strong uh, drive to continue to expand oil palm in uh, these countries? Well, this is, this is the main reason. Well, this graph illustrates why. Um, the export, uh, the foreign revenue from the export of palm oil amounts to uh, uh, more than 17 billion US dollars in Indonesia. Um, that's a sizable chunk of the annual GDP. It's about 2% of GDP coming from just one crop. And, and we're only talking about foreign revenue. There are a lot of uh, downstream industries that are also associated with uh, oil palm the retail industry, manufacturing industry, service industry, and all of those contribute substantially to the GDP as well. So recently, one of my PhD students, uh, or former PhD students, uh, Janice Lee, became interested in this issue. And so she wanted to find out what, uh, uh, what is the social economic significance of Indonesia meeting its 2020 target. So what would society as a whole uh, stand to gain if they were to achieve that target? And this is what she found, uh, just for the island of Sumatra alone. The additional amount of national tax revenues to be derived from meeting that 2020 target amounts to almost 4.5 billion US dollars from one island, from one crop. And this is just additional to what's already been collected. Um, the development of that industry of oil palm in Sumatra would also uh, lead to the establishment or the expansion of uh, roads on the island uh, in the order of thousands of kilometers. So there would be significant infrastructure investment and development associated with meeting this uh, target. Now, and additionally, the creation of jobs is another big uh, driving force. Uh, Janice found out that um, if Indonesia were to meet this target, then the expansion of the, of the plantations and the expansion of the associated downstream industry could create 
up to 200 or 270,000 new jobs for, for just the island of Sumatra. So I hope you are beginning to see that this is a huge, huge driving force. The, the social economic factors are, are basically what's underpinning this expansion of uh, oil palm industry in both Indonesia and Malaysia. So this brings us back to um, this idea of a need for balance. Now I'm sure the Indonesian society uh, understands the value of forests and, and biodiversity and they see the need to protect them. But at the same time, I'm sure they are grappling with the need for economic development um, and the need to improve uh, human livelihoods in their communities uh, across Indonesia. However, uh, there is not just one pathway to development. There could be alternative pathways. So a while ago, uh, a few of us decided to tackle this issue. We decided to uh, perform um, scenario analysis and develop a uh, mobile application that we hope would help to clarify this problem um, to the stakeholders in Indonesia. So I'll try to go through uh, some of these scenarios, uh, but not all of them because I don't have time. So on this graph, the x-axis indicates um, increase in oil palm production, and the y-axis indicates the magnitude of an impact uh, caused by that increase in oil palm production. So in this case, it's showing us uh, primary forest loss. Uh, you could look at other impacts. You could look at impacts on biodiversity, impacts on food, um, carbon uh, stocks, and so on. But let's begin with um, deforestation, primary forest loss. Each one of these colored lines indicate um, a particular scenario or pathway to development. There is, of course, the business as usual scenario. Okay, let me just remove the rest. Well, under this scenario, um, Indonesia will locate its future oil palm pl plantations onto lands that are most suitable for oil palm uh, in an effort to uh, maximize yields and maximize profit. So if that were the case, then um, deforestation in Indonesia would increase more or less linearly with oil palm production. Um, but there is an alternative approach, uh, which we call the pro-forest uh, approach. Now under this approach, Indonesia would locate its future plantations onto lands that are non-forested. So plantations would be diverted to um, the degraded lands, the barren lands, the grasslands, uh, young secondary forests, and it's only until those have been um, converted to plantations would the uh, older uh, s secondary forests and primary forests be to be uh, converted. So if Indonesia were to uh, go with this scenario, then they could potentially postpone any impacts on um, primary forests until much later in the scenario when uh, oil palm production and demand exceeds about 700 million tons per year. So the pro-forest approach is very good for conserving forests, but it has a trade-off. And that is the real uh, purpose of this uh, analysis, is to demonstrate trade-offs. If we look at food production um, as an impact, now the y-axis shows us an impact on Indonesia's annual rice production capacity. We see that the two lines have swapped positions. Um, the pro-forest approach, although it's good for protecting forests, actually has a bigger impact on Indonesia's rice production of food security, in other words, than the business as usual approach. And so by uh, allowing the user to switch between the different scenarios and look at the different impacts, this application is meant to uh, help them visualize uh, the impacts and better understand the trade-offs. So let me come back to uh, this graph uh, for a minute. So when Sinan analyzed the data, he showed us that uh, about 5.6 million hectares of forests were lost within the concession boundaries of those four uh, main industries. But he also found that there are actually <coughs> about 24 million hectares of forest that still remains within these concessions. And most of that forest uh, is found within logging concessions. 
So the obvious question to ask is, what can we do to save those forests, to protect those forests? Um, because the fate of these forests would, to a large extent, determine the fate of Indonesia's forests uh, as a whole. But perhaps a more uh, realistic question to ask is, which forests should we prioritize to save uh, within these logging concessions? Now, to answer that question, we first need to understand um, whether logged forests are all the same in terms of their biodiversity values. Um, another one of my PhD students, Susanna, uh, decided to uh, tackle this question in her PhD uh, research. So she um, did a comprehensive literature review, um, collected um, quite a, a big data set from studies uh, published that reported the impacts of logging across a range of logging intensities on a range of taxonomic groups. And she then did a meta-analysis on, on that data set. And this is what she found. So again, I, I, I'm not going into the details, I'll just briefly mention the main uh, findings or results. So in this diagram, the y-axis indicates increasing logging intensity going from um, a pristine forest on the right-hand side to a severely uh, logged forest on the le uh, on the right-hand side. So sorry, pristine forest on the left to severely logged forest on the right. And each one of those uh, bars indicate the response of uh, a taxonomic group to uh, this logging intensity. Now let us look at uh, the data for mammals, for, ex for an example. So the green part of that bar indicates the logging intensities at which the mammals would uh, not suffer uh, greatly from, from logging. In fact, they would be able to maintain their species richness at the level, uh, at the original level from the uh, control of primary forest site. But as we start to increase logging intensity and we move into the orange uh, part of the bar, uh, this is the these are the logging intensities when the uh, the mammals will start to experience a decline in species richness, but they will still be able to maintain their diversity at at least 50% of um, what it was in the primary forest site. As we continue to increase logging intensity, we soon come uh, to a point indicated by the red arrow, um, which we call the lethal logging intensity, 50. And this is the point whereby uh, mammals would experience at least a 50% decline in species richness. And of course, if logging co intensity continues to increase, the, the species richness will decrease even further. So there are two main um, take-home messages from, from this uh, study. The first is, a perhaps more important one, that there is no such thing as a logged forest. There is only a gradient of logging intensities. And the second take-home message is different taxonomic groups respond differently to this gradient of uh, logging intensities. So why, why is this important? I, I think it's important because it um, clarifies, again, it clarifies the issue of um, logging, uh, of selective logging, and it tells us whether, or rather it tells us that when we are discussing and making land use decisions about uh, selective logging, we shouldn't be thinking of them as a uniform uh, category of, of land cover or land use, but rather we should treat them as a gradient. And um, by doing so, we would be able to be better able to prioritize parts of the se selectively logged forests for conservation or for conversion. And uh, let me come back to this uh, oil palm issue again. As Many of us would have seen in the media, um, the orangutans are a flagship species of many conservation groups in Indonesia and in Malaysia uh, in regards to the problem of oil palm expansion. And many of us might have seen uh, reports, uh, horrific reports of orangutans being shot uh, or even burned alive just to keep them out of oil palm plantations. But this is causing a lot of concern among the uh, primate biologists. Um, who are worried about the, the future, uh, the, the plight of these species as oil palm plantations continue to grow. Um, but the fact is, many of uh, the primate biologists do not really fully 
understand where these species are distributed. So we don't have much information on their distribution and their occupancy. And that's partly because of the uh, challenges, uh, t the logistical challenges of uh, conducting uh, surveys to monitor these populations. So the conventional method of surveying for orangutans is to walk the forest on foot with a pair of binoculars and to try to detect and count their nests in treetops. And from that information, try to estimate uh, population density. And as you can imagine, this is a very time-consuming and labor-intensive uh, process. In fact, the last orangutan survey in Indonesia uh, was done only for the island of uh, Sumatra, and it took them four years to do it. It cost them almost a quarter of a million dollars. So by the time the survey was done, large parts of the habitats were already converted to oil palm. So there is a real urgent need for primate biologists working in that area to come up with a new uh, way, a, more a rapid way and a more cost-effective way of monitoring orangutan populations. Now about two and a half years ago, um, my colleague Serge Week and I um, started using uh, conservation drones to survey for orangutan nests in uh, S Sumatra. So Serge is a primate biologist who has been studying orangutans for the last 20 years in Sumatra. So we became quite good at it. So in this video uh, footage, you can even see the uh, orangutan um, if you look carefully enough. Maybe I'll try to point it out. So, so, it's, uh, so the orangutan nest is over there. Um, but it's more visible from still photographic uh, images, uh, like this one you see. So this is an image taken with by one of our conservation drones flying over the forest in Sumatra at about 60 meters above, um, above the canopy. Um, and the resolution of such images are very high. They can be as high as 1 to 2 centimeters per pixel. It's uh, sufficient resolution, resolution for you to even count the leaves on, on the trees. So it's definitely good enough for us to uh, detect the nests and to count the nests. We are currently working with uh, computer vision scientists to develop algorithms that can automatically uh, detect these nests from the thousands of photos we've collected so far um, and to make the job uh, much easier. But orangutan nests are not the only objects uh, you, can, you can detect with these uh, UAVs or drones. We've been partnering with uh, many colleagues around the world. Um, one of them is a sender from the Max Planck Institute. And he brought one of our drones to, to Gabon to look at chimpanzee nests. And he's, uh, he has also been quite successful at detecting and, and using this technology to estimate uh, their uh, population density. Um, you could also potentially um, detect uh, turtle nests on beaches just by flying over them. You could look at tree level phenomena or stand level phenomena. For example, this is a dead or dying tree. You could definitely use it to study um, uh, flowering or fruiting phenology because the resolution is high enough for that. Um, this picture was taken when we were in Panama uh, on the uh, Barro Colorado Island. And we were there to uh, bring some of these UAVs to uh, some fellow colleagues from the Smithsonian Institute. And this is a tree fall gap. So you could potentially uh, fly it over this gap uh, at frequent, uh, regularly, um, maybe once a month or so, and monitor how the forest regenerates. You could use it to e uh, monitor illegal activities in the landscape. So this is uh, a pair of pictures taken uh, when we were flying over the Gunung Lusa National Park in Sumatra. Now the picture on the left was uh, taken um, in October last year. And the more recent one on the right shows uh, us where deforestation happened. So you can see a patch of forest that's been recently cleared. And the loggers were uh, very uh, devious in, in, in that they were leaving or they left a strip of forest along the riverbank to obscure this patch of deforested uh, for, uh, land from the river traffic. So you wouldn't be able to uh, tell that there is a f uh, an illegally, illegally logged forest 
uh, on that uh, at that site without flying over the over the forest with a drone. So we provided these uh, data to the local authorities who subsequently prosecuted uh, um, the, the perpetrators. Of course, you can also use these uh, drones to, to detect the animals themselves. So this is a wild orangutan that was uh, feeding on top of a palm tree while we were flying over it. Uh, here are a few forest buffaloes, um, an elephant. Uh, this is a pair of rhinoceros uh, that was taking a bath on a, on a, on a small stream uh, while we were there in, in Nepal. Um, Thing early la last year, and but perhaps the most useful part about um, taking these pictures is you can later stitch them together to produce um, real-time, high-resolution land-use land cover maps like this 20,000 hectare oil palm landscape that we mapped in Borneo. So this kind of uh, data is useful not only for uh, researchers who are wanting to keep track of the forest fragments. But it could also be useful for the uh, uh, the, plant, the planters or the oil palm growers who want to keep track of their assets to know uh, how many trees are in a particular field, which could have uh, very important financial implications in terms of the application of agrochemicals and so on. So there are lots of different potential applications uh, of conservation drones. I don't have time to go through uh, all of them, unfortunately. But if you're interested, like I mentioned earlier, just go to our website and, um, and find out more for yourself or contact me uh, for more information. So why am I telling you about conservation drones? Well, I think conservation drones and mobile applications or the other more conventional analysis that I've mentioned in the talk are tools, are useful tools that could potentially uh, inform decision makers potentially help them better understand and evaluate the, the impacts and the trade-offs of alternative land use and development options you know, in relation to both environmental and socio-economic priorities. So if anything, that is the take-home message that I hope to have conveyed in this presentation. And finally, I don't have an answer to the question I posed in the title of this talk, um, so I don't know if we could all have our cake and eat it too. But perhaps if we uh, are able to learn from our mistakes from the past and are willing to embrace the exciting technologies and futures of the future and indeed of the present as well, then maybe we have a shot at uh, figuring out a way to reconcile these competing priorities in time for us to save the forests and species that we care so much about. Thank you very much. Hi, uh, I just had uh, playing the devil's advocate here. So, don't you think it's a little hypocritical to expect Indonesia to maintain such a high forest cover? I mean, in India, we barely have 11% of decent forest left. Mm -hmm. uh, we have 23% legal, legally declared forest area. Singapore is probably down to one or five percent. So, do you think we should challenge? the kind of uh, change, the forest loss that Indonesia, I mean the track, that development track that Indonesia is taking. Uh, and second, don't you think it would be more productive to look at the larger socio-economic uh, kind of scenario in which this is happening and perhaps challenge it based on the differential kind of cost benefit to different sections of uh, society? Right. Well, thank you for the question. Actually, that's exactly what I was trying to convey in, in this presentation, that, well, at least personally, I would rather contribute to the discussion and the, de and the debate by providing data, the hard data and the analysis uh, for the Indonesian society to make their own decision about what they want to do, because ultimately it is their country, 
and they have a right to make that decision. And through the kinds of scenario analysis and the kinds of visualizations that I uh, am working uh, on for my research, I hope to facilitate that discussion among the different stakeholders in Indonesia. And one of the key points of this presentation was to emphasize the need exactly to consider the trade-offs, uh, to consider different priorities and not just be focused on any particular one. And so I agree completely with what, what you're saying. Hello. Thank you, Leanne. Um, Leanne, yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, thank you for the very interesting talk. Um, a few yeah. months ago in Malta, a conservation drone was shot down uh, because it was thought that it was being used as an advocate for some controversial conservation legislation. My question to you is, um, there is quite a bit of criticism on the use of UAVs in conservation. Um, saying that it is leading to a more militarized form of conservation. Would you please uh, comment on that and on how ethical is, t is it to use drones in conservation and how sort of that results in uh, conflict with local people who live around these areas? Sure. I think part of the problem is the definition of drones. Um, when we started this project, we specifically put the conservation in front of drones to try to differentiate ourselves from perhaps the more m militant type of, of drones, the, the spy drones or the military drones. Um, for us, our kind of, of drones is more of a, a, just a tool. It's no different than a pair of binoculars that's flying around in the air. That's, that's our understanding of, of drones. Um, so we never had any intention to m militarize the drones, to have weapon systems on them, or even to use them for uh, uh, spying on, on villages and so on. So it was purely uh, a, a data, an ecological data gathering uh, tool for us. Leon? Here, here. Yes. Yeah. Uh, initially, you mentioned that we have to learn from Singapore because we, Singapore lost 80% of its biodiversity. But across the world, uh, many countries look to Singapore as a model for their development. So what is your opinion regarding that? Well, it's sort of, well, in a way, it's sort of the first question, uh, similar to the first question I got. Um, what, I'm try what I was trying to say is that we, we should learn from Singapore in the sense that we shouldn't be too focused on any one particular priority. So in the, sen in the case, when the first, in the first question, I guess, the, the, the point was that we shouldn't be too focused on just the conservation priority. We should also look at um, livelihoods and, and economic development. And this question, you are p perhaps saying that we shouldn't focus too much on economic development. So I was trying to bring all these uh, different uh, factors uh, into, into consideration in my talk and just trying to emphasize that we need to consider all of them together. And Singapore was uh, perhaps highlighted as a lesson because perhaps too much emphasis was placed on economic development and not uh, on uh, the other uh, equally important aspects of, of society or s priorities of society. I hope that, that answers your question. So one of the global major drivers of deforestation has been in the past for timber. And in the Amazon, we've seen the certification of timber production really helping regulate and control deforestation. Now, in Southeast Asia, most of the timber is sold internally, so that's not an option. But much of the rubber and the palm oil is exported internationally. So do you think things like certified palm oil or certified rubber, which actually have conservation or sustainability standards could help maintain biodiversity in these landscapes while guaranteeing a good price for people who are producing it and meeting those standards? Um, thanks, Alice, for the question. I, I think that's, that's a very difficult question to answer, and, and I get that question a lot. Um, well, I, I, I think what I will say is um, certification schemes like the round table on sustainable palm oil and uh, some of the national level certification schemes that are being developed or already uh, developed and adopted by uh, national uh, companies are, as, uh, are a step in the right 
direction. So they, they ensure that companies who do the right things are recognized for their effort because it is a big effort. It's a lot of investment to, uh, to have auditors come into your plantations, to do things in a proper way. It's a, lot of, uh, it's, it's a big cost to many of these companies. So I think the certification schemes allow, uh, allow these companies to be recognized and perhaps would also encourage other companies to, to follow suit. Um, I don't, well, I cannot, well, how should I put it politically correctly? <laughs> so I'm, I'm not that convinced about the biodiversity value of, of those certification schemes, uh, to, to put it in a way. Um, because ultimately, in, in a huge oil palm landscape like the one you saw on one of my slides in Sabah, it's a monoculture and you can't run away from the fact that it's a monoculture. So you can have pockets of forests here and there, but oftentimes these are small pockets of forest. They are tens of hectares or at most hundreds of hectares. And most of them are empty forests, devoid of, of any you know, mammal or bird species or, or specialist species at least. So. Perhaps there is scope to improve um, the, the biodiversity value of those certification schemes by maybe um, coordinating the different companies to uh, set aside their forests in a way that would create a corridor that then it becomes more useful, joining two, um, perhaps two national parks together uh, that are separated by uh, an oil palm landscape. So there is scope for, for that, but at the moment I don't think um, it really has any, or it, ha it really has much conservation value. I think the value lies in recognizing the, the industry for the efforts they have put in and pushing them in the right direction. Yeah. Hi. Uh, thank you for the presentation. I'd like to ask you two questions. Uh, firstly, how much uh, noise do the drones make while surveying and whether that affects actual animal count? And uh, secondly, I'd like, like you to elaborate on the use of drones in poaching, say where lack of rapid uh, response teams has been a critical factor. Sure. Um, yeah, I'm surprised. I keep getting questions about the noise level from drones. Um, they, are, they are not very noisy. Uh, of course, it, d it depends on the kind of the, the actual unit that you are, you are using. Um, I was telling the, the people at the workshop yesterday, um, there was a, an instance, or there was an, a, a trip in, in Borneo um, about two years ago when we were there, and we were flying a drone over um, a forest, and it so happened that there was a group of um, wild elephants um, that were being tracked by a group of uh, researchers. So the researchers were able to observe uh, what, how the elephants behaved. And in response to the drone flying overhead. And it was flying overhead at about 100 meters above ground. So the elephants um, at first were quite disturbed, so they were aware that something was going on that they were not familiar with. But the researchers told us that after a few minutes, they became <coughs> habituated to the noise and just went about their business. So I think there are ways to, uh, to maybe uh, habituate animals that you're trying to observe um, using drones. I think it's basically the same concept as observing animals on the ground as well. You, you have to uh, habituate them. Um, now with regards to your second question, um, the use of UAVs or drones for anti-poaching efforts uh, in Nepal, which is the, the place where we've been uh, doing this quite a bit, um, was to collect information on on uh, where the poachers are or where their campfire or campsites might be at night. So these, the idea is to fly these uh, drones from one checkpoint to the next because you can program them, them to land automatically at another location. Um, so it would be going from what checkpoint one to checkpoint two to checkpoint three um, and uh, replace the need for um, foot soldiers to be patrolling those uh, checkpoints on foot. Um, thereby reducing some of the cost of conservation. The, the other uh, use is to send them to areas where, the s where it's completely inaccessible to, to soldiers, perhaps down deep valleys or up hills and so on, uh, which the drones are fully capable of doing. Um, but in all of, all of those applications, um, the, the goal is to uh, 
acquire video or image from the ground uh, to try to detect uh, these poachers or their campsites. Uh, hi. Yes. Uh, considering that uh, you know, uh, Indonesia has orangutans which are very charismatic and appealing, and also some of the outer lying islands have extremely colorful and beautiful birds, uh, don't you think the tourism indu industry can mitigate some of these uh, threats to the forests? Um, well, I think I think so. I, I am not an expert in that field, but I I think with the tourism industry, it's it's highly fluctuating. So it, it depends on the economy of of well, that the country where the tourist comes from. It d depends on the exchange rate of the countries. So there are many factors that are causing uh, often causing large swings in tourist traffic, and that might result in uh, an unstable source of, of uh, revenue to sustain any conservation efforts on a large scale in those, uh, in those islands. But I'm sure you are right that they are contributing to uh, funding some of those conservation efforts. Uh, hello, uh, I'm from Cambodia. Uh, I think the main goal that the government uh, of Indonesia... Yeah, I think the main... Yeah, go ahead, please. Yeah, I see you. Please go ahead, yeah. Yeah, I think the main goal that Indonesian government as well as uh, other Asian countries convert the, uh, the forest into agricultural landscape because they want to reduce poverty in the countries. As you saw that Indonesia and Malaysia and such as in Cambodia lost a lot of forests. And do you think that poverty is still in the countries or have been reduced or eliminated in that countries? Well, or I'm just... Uh, a large amount of money going to just only one person. So I'm not so sure that uh, it uh, still is a poverty alleviation um, um, effort um, by the governments of those countries in, in their uh, drive to expand the oil palm uh, industry in, in those countries. Um, because um, in a separate study that we have also done, but I haven't uh, shown today, we showed that most of the deforestation within the oil palm sector is actually driven by the big oil palm companies or concessions that belong to the big oil palm companies. And the smallholder farmers uh, contribute relatively uh, little to, to causing deforestation. So I would think it's, it's mostly <coughs> um, what from the perspective of the government, and this is just my opinion, of course I don't know, it perhaps is um, it's, it's, it's driven by um, revenue, mainly to sustain um, the, the economy, because it's become such an important and entrenched uh, source of, of, of uh, tax revenue uh, for the country, and source of employment and infrastructure development, as, as you have seen in my talk. So I don't think it is still uh, a way to alleviate poverty per se, uh, but it does definitely contributes to building the, uh, the, the economy of those countries. Thank, Thank you. Thank you so much, Leon, for that talk. I'm here okay. on, the, on your left. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Can't see me. Don't have my glasses. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, yeah, yeah, okay. Hi. Uh, thank you so much. That was very interesting, and it really helps to see these things visually. Uh, my question is, uh, we have uh, an existing lack of field staff in India, and we are really grappling with the question of what it means to introduce software or any kind of surveillance which is not field-based in the sense which is not sort of the mud-on-boots approach. So what would be your advice for a country where... Um, we have a lack of staff, and there is some skepticism about uh, this sort of armchair surveillance really phasing out or making obsolete other um, forms of um, field surveillance. How do we strike the balance? What would be your advice? Um, well, I can only speak from my experience of, of using these conservation drones, um, and that is definitely not an armchair uh, uh, activity because you still have to go in the field. You, don't, you might not need to go deep into the forest, but you still have to uh, be somewhere close by. Um, but I completely agree with you that um, to become an effective um, conservation biologist or conservationist, we really have to get our um, 
people on the ground. And I always encourage my students to have a field component to their, to their research. Uh, and personally, I, I, I think I learned more from my work in the, plant, in the oil palm plantations than, than doing any of these analysis back in the, in the lab. And I learned most just by talking to the plantation owners, to the small holders, uh, who give me insights that, that you wouldn't uh, otherwise have. So I value that, that aspect of research and, and I encourage that uh, uh, greatly. Um, the development of these conservation drones is, is not so much um, a way to escape from the field, so to speak, but to try to reduce the cost of conservation in, in many of these places that we've been to. Because they are facing a real, uh, like you said, shortage of uh, manpower and shortage of funds, so it really is a way to to complement what ha is already going on in the field, rather than to substitute for that. Thank you. Thanks, Leon. Uh, thanks for raising one of the uh, probably the most important issues related to the conservation, that is, the global population. You have said that uh, 9.6 to 12.3 billion population will be there. You have raised the issue of farm oil industry as well. My question is little generic. Do we have any scientific study or scientific model that tells us the carrying capacity of the planet in terms of human population? Mm -hmm. Let's say after having n billion of people, there will be start of collapsing of human population simply due to lack of resources? Um, that's a very important question, but I don't have the answer. <laughs> um, I d what I can say is I think a while ago there have been a big hoo-ha about these tipping points, global tipping points that some organizations have come up with um, and saying that we have already uh, gone beyond those tipping points. But then there is also another group or another school of thought that challenges that, that assertion, saying that how would we ever know if, if the tipping point has been reached, which is sort of consistent with what you are uh, raising here. So in a nutshell, I don't know the answer to that, um, but, but it's, a, it's a question worth pursuing. Thank you so much, Leon, for the wonderful talk. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Before we break for tree, there are a couple of announcements. Uh, Shivani 